I'm John Banther, and this is Season 2 of Classical Breakdown. From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, I'm joined by Classical WETA host Bill Bukowski. We explore the life of Ludwig van Beethoven, which was filled with groundbreaking music, but it was also tragic. From his first composition to his world-changing Symphony No. 9, we listen to samples of his music and try to better understand the life of one of the greatest composers. All right, Bill. I've got a pop quiz. It's multiple choice, but are you up for it? Sure, why not? Okay. Who said the following quote? The daily grind exhausts me. Okay, the daily grind exhausts me. Was it A, me, five minutes ago? Was it B, you, ten minutes ago? Was it C, Beethoven in 1823? Or was it D, everyone on earth who has ever existed? <laughs> kind of a trick question, isn't it? Yeah, kind of the is. An- the answer is obviously D. It's obviously D, but of course, Bill, the answer is always C, oh, right? Okay. So it's all kind of true, but Beethoven did say that in 1823 to his nephew, Carl. And I like that. I can imagine them you know, sitting down for a, a coffee in a cafe in Vienna, and he's just telling his nephew, oh, the daily grind exhausts me. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it brings Beethoven down to our more mortal level that even t- he too would succumb to these humanistic issues. Which I think is just about right since that's exactly the kind of person he was. He was he was talking to us and still is down through the years. And so we're going to go through the life of Beethoven, who has become basically the most recognizable name in classical music. So Beethoven, born in December, baptized on the 17th in 1770. He died March 26th, 1827. And for a little musical context, Bach had died just 20 years earlier before Beethoven uh, was born, and Mozart was born just 14 years ahead of him. Uh, He was born in Bonn to a kind of a lineage of musicians. His father was a singer in the royal court. His grandfather, the same name, Ludwig van Beethoven, was a singer in the royal court and even the music director for a while. And it was pretty clear early on that Beethoven wanted to be a musician, wasn't it? That's what I hear, yes. it's. I think back then, studying music was the thing that people, a lot, a lot of people really wanted to do. Yeah, especially, of course, in Vienna, the basically the hub for music in Europe, especially at this point. And he gets this early interest in music. His father is his first teacher, which is tragic in its own way because his father was actually abusive and he was an alcoholic. And he was very, very strict with Beethoven, very stern. You have to study these basics. Um, Beethoven would learn those and want to improvise on something. And his father would scold him. His father would wake him up in the middle of the night when he would come home drunk with a friend, make him perform for them. It was just really, it wasn't a great environment for um, for Beethoven. Yeah, in essence, he was the opposite of Leopold Mozart, who he was trying to follow in terms of, you know, you've got a son who's got some talent, uh, let's... Let's nurture that talent. But uh, Beethoven's father, I think, went the complete opposite direction that Leopold went, and uh, it was not a good thing. No, it wasn't. And eventually his drinking would cost him his own job, and um, his father would die um, kind of early as, as well. Beethoven was studying. He was working with the court organist in composition. And we can go ahead and listen to you know, what is the first composition ever written by Beethoven? And it is a set of nine variations on a march by Dressler. Let's hear a little bit of it. How fitting is it that the first bit of a first real composition from Beethoven starts in C minor. Yes, that's right. One of his favorite keys. I think the other thing, too, that's interesting in that it's an instantly recognizable tune. It was the first time that we see Beethoven taking a a well-known tune and having some fun with it, doing some variations on it. He would do this throughout his career. Yeah, and he was only 12 years old. And already, well, first, Beethoven, he's kind of a virtuoso. He's a prodigy at the keyboard from in early age. So it seems like he kind of has what you can sort of call, I guess, a typical childhood. There's not too much written about besides that his father is trying to make him into this kind of Mozart figure in terms of this prodigy that everyone should adore. Um, 
he has his typical childhood issues. His father, unfortunately, as we've already said, was abusive. But he makes his first big trip in 1787. Beethoven is now 16 years old, and he goes to Vienna. And that it goes into the a big debate and question, and that is, did Beethoven ever meet Mozart? That is a good question. You hear a lot of different stories connected with that. What's the real truth there? The real truth is that we have no real evidence that the two ever met. And we think of Beethoven now, of course, this godly figure in music. When he was 16, he was a prodigy, but great keyboard players in their teens were wasn't super rare or something. So it's also you have to think, would Mozart have really cared to hear this young nobody coming in from, from Bonn? Yeah, exactly. And maybe he Mozart had heard a number of wonderful young keyboard players too. Yeah. There's no evidence of the two meeting, but that doesn't mean Beethoven perhaps didn't actually see Mozart while he was in Vienna. He could have perhaps seen him at a concert. We know later on, and we'll get into this, um, these conversation books that Beethoven used when he was really um, almost completely had a loss of hearing, that someone asked, hey, you met Mozart was a, a good piano player. And that's all we really have. So it's possible he saw Mozart. It's possible he heard him in a concert, but... There's just no hard evidence. There's no hard evidence. There's not even real evidence of his time in Vienna. It may have been a couple of weeks. It may have been a few months. But we do know that it was cut short because he had to go back home to Bonn because his mother was very sick and she died shortly thereafter um, from tuberculosis. But there's another figure, isn't there, in Vienna who is kind of the master of music at this time. Think of Haydn. Haydn actually met Beethoven, not in Vienna, but in Bonn on his way to London. And I love just the kind of serendipity of this meeting because if Beethoven's grandfather had not moved to Bonn, Beethoven wouldn't be in Bonn and Haydn would not have met him. So perhaps Beethoven in another life would have been a shoemaker or (laughs) um, a furniture maker or something like that. It's interesting to think too, and I'm I'm thinking too about uh, did... Beethoven meet Mozart when really back then the much more important meeting would have been Haydn. Haydn at that time was the most famous musician in Europe and that would would have been a more significant meeting anyway and as of course we know that it wasn't just a meeting it ended up there being a, a teacher-pupil relationship. When Beethoven was 21 he would then move to Vienna to study with Haydn. Haydn as you just said is this mega popular person in classical music now, but their relationship wasn't as cordial or it just wasn't as loving as I think we would have hoped it would have been. More chalk and cheese than anything else, I think. I think because Haydn was really pushing on Beethoven counterpoint, some of the basics of composing, and perhaps Beethoven felt he was beyond that at this point and wanted to do other things. And he studied with some other composers in in Vienna But what I love about art and music especially, when you learn the rules, you know exactly how to break the rules. Right, exactly. And Beethoven certainly knew how to break the rules. And he's still known at this time not as a composer but as a virtuoso pianist, isn't he? Yeah, and isn't that kind of what he wanted to do? That was what he was really set out to do was to be a musician, a a touring musician. No, exactly. He was a virtuoso and was kind of common at that time. He was also composing. That was part of the part of being a well-rounded musician. So we can look at some of his, well, first, his real opus one, and that is the first work he would have published, something that he thought would represent himself. And it is a piano trio. And I think, Bill, you'll you can tell us here. What's kind of happening between these instruments? Perhaps one is more favored than the other. Well, certainly in that little passage there, the piano is the star. Oh, yeah. It was clear Beethoven's writing this piano trio, but he's writing it for himself at the keyboard, and he would be showing off and um, really displaying the virtuosic qualities of himself and of and of the keyboard. But this still, at this time, um, when he's 25 years old, 
it still sounds like Beethoven, but really, it's it's following Mozart. It's following Haydn. What's interesting, too, about that, it is in that style, but the piano player is playing with a great deal more assertiveness and force and energy than we normally expect to hear from, say, uh, Mozart or even Haydn. I think it was also Beethoven's style of playing all the things you just said, which actually helped develop the actual piano, the instrument, because it was much smaller. It sounded much more tinkery than it does today back then. Yeah, and there was always stories about in later years, Beethoven would be playing the piano and damaging them because he was playing with just a little too much force. Oh, yeah. So he's 25 years old, and before he's 30, we can listen to a couple of his number one works, his first piano sonata, his first string quartet, and his first symphony. Here is a little bit of the opening to his first piano sonata. And we can already hear in that opening, well, that first part, that those notes going up to the top, what do we call that? Uh, Mannheim Rocket. Mannheim Rocket. That is following right in the classical tradition. And that's something we talked about in the What is a Symphony episode. He's following in the footsteps still of Haydn, of Mozart, with these openings. It's a nice arpeggio, and it's setting the scene. It's setting the mood. But he would also, later on, we can listen to a bit of the fourth movement, he goes in just an extreme example in using the piano. And something that Beethoven did was he used the full range of the keyboard. Right. Right. And you can even, as you're hearing this, you can even hear in your mind future sonatas that he has yet to write, like the Great Moonlight Sonata, for example. Oh, yeah. Beethoven was a very distinctive player even then. Yes. And like the Moonlight and like Fur Elise, and he has these, he's able to just right from the beginning of, of the beginning of pieces to paint a, just a very descriptive and colorful picture in the music in a way that I think composers before, even at this point, weren't quite doing as well. It was, I don't want to say superficial, but it wasn't to like the depth of emotion that Beethoven was grabbing. No, he definitely grabbed the sort of romantic spirit as it was just being born there. Here's a little bit of his string quartet number one in the first movement. Kind of a characteristic opening we've heard from other works so far. Yeah, inviting people in to pay attention. The, the music sort of grabs you because it, the way it stops and then starts again, it, it's interesting. Yeah. And we'll listen to a little bit of the fourth movement here. And this, I think, really paints the picture of, at this point, who Beethoven is as a musician and a composer. It's very nice, and it's a string quartet, but I don't hear a string quartet. I hear Beethoven at the keyboard. This sounds like he wrote something for the piano, and then he said, oh, i got to write something out for the string quartet, and he wrote it out. I hear Beethoven at the keyboard here. Fascinating. The way the voices are, the way the notes are kind of put together, it sounds, well, I feel like I can hear Beethoven. Now, already with his first symphony, something is changing, right? This opening is different than other openings of symphonies up to this point in that we have the first even the first chord it's like it's asking a question yeah it's it's like a cadence that you would hear at the end of a musical phrase rather than at the beginning here's that chord it sounds it's like we're going somewhere right this, this isn't complete there's this tension and what what happens next right and he has this kind of question and answer. And up to this point with especially symphonies, the opening is, it can, of course, be in a minor key, but it's also 
as you said, inviting you in. It's setting the scene and giving you an answer. Hey, this is what this is. But right at the start, at the start, he asks you this question, and then there's a response. I get this impression from Beethoven with all of his music that he is really trying. He, he's not just writing something to be played in the background. He's writing something that he wants people to be participants in. Yeah, a lot of music is written for banquets, for for dinners as background music. But Beethoven, following I guess Haydn towards the end with these symphonies premiering in London, it's it's something serious and that we should be listening to kind of closely. Now, he's 31 years old, and according to Beethoven, for a few years now, he's noticed problems with his hearing. There's, I think it's a, like, a, like a hiss, um, a little kind of maybe similar to tinnitus, but it's, it's becoming a problem. And now he's 31, and he's come to realize, having gone through several doctors, that this is hearing loss, and this is likely permanent, and it will likely get worse. Imagine getting news like that from your doctor when you're 31 years old and your career is in music. And Beethoven is absolutely devastated. He's despondent. He becomes, I think this is where we start to really misunderstand Beethoven. And that is because he seemed so aggressive, so cold, so uninviting at times. And that was because he was for years trying to hide his hearing loss. And he, the doctor said, okay, you need to come to terms with this. Go to Heiligenstadt, which is basically just a little country suburb right next to Vienna. Rest your hearing, rest your mind, and come, come to grips with this. And this is where we have this, what we call the Heiligenstadt Testament. But really, it's a will. He's like writing out his own will, and he's 31 years old. And he contemplates even taking his own life. So I've compiled here, it's quite a long document, but I've compiled here big excerpts, and we'll hear them read by Classical WETA's Nicole Lacroix. O ye men who regard or declare me to be malignant, stubborn, or cynical, how unjust are ye towards me! You do not know the secret cause of my seeming so. From childhood onward, my heart and mind prompted me to be kind and tender, and I was ever inclined to accomplish great deeds. But only think that during the last six years I have been in a wretched condition, deceived from year to year with hopes of improvement, and then finally forced to the prospect of lasting infirmity. For me, there can be no recreation in the society of my fellow creatures, no refined conversations, no interchange of thought. Almost alone, and only mixing in society when absolutely necessary, I am compelled to live as an exile. If I approach near to people, a feeling of hot anxiety comes over me, lest my condition should be noticed. For so it was during these past six months which I spent in the country ordered by my intelligent physician to spare my hearing as much as possible. But how humiliating was it when someone standing close to me heard a distant flute and I heard nothing, or a shepherd singing and again I heard nothing. Such incidents almost drove me to despair. At times I was on the point of putting an end to my life. Art alone restrained my hand. Oh, it seemed as if I could not quit this earth until I had produced all I felt within me. And so I continued this wretched life, wretched indeed, with so sensitive a body that a somewhat sudden change can throw me from the best into the worst state. So let it be. I joyfully hasten to meet death. If it come before I have had opportunity to develop all my artistic faculties, it will come my hard fate notwithstanding, too soon, and I should probably wish it later, yet even then I shall be happy, for will it not deliver me from a state of endless suffering? Come when thou wilt, I shall face thee courageously. Farewell, and when I am dead, do not entirely forget me. 
This I deserve from you, for during my lifetime I often thought of you and how to make you happy. It's incredible to think of Beethoven, this massive figure, having just this these awful moments, these awful times, this anxiety, this despair, to the point where he writes something like this. Yeah, in, in contemporary practices, this would be considered journaling. You know, people that have a, an issue or something, the counsel is to write it down, get it down on paper, write it down, write your thoughts down. But what's interesting about this is this is a letter. This isn't just musing or a diary entry. This is actually in a letter. If you really come right down to it, he's speaking to us, to everyone. He was speaking to the people, the music lovers then, and he's speaking to us today. And the thing is, no one knew about this until after Beethoven died. Right. That's, that's also something remarkable to think about, too. This was something that he was writing down for the future. He was talking to us, really, when you get right down to it. He was talking to somebody, that some other person, that immortal beloved whatever you want to, whatever name you want to put to it. It's really quite remarkably a very personal statement too. And uh, it's also all the more remarkable that nobody read it until after his death. So far, we've explored what we call the early period in Beethoven's life and in his composition. And now after he is in Heiligenstadt, he's written this testament and he finds this renewed purpose of, I live for the art. I I welcome death, but if I don't write everything I need to write, it comes a moment too soon. We're going to get into his middle period right after this. October is Passion Month on Choral Showcase, and on Sunday, October 11th, we'll hear Beethoven's only oratorio, Christ on the Mount of Olives, a very humanistic portrayal of Christ's personal struggle at the Garden of Gethsemane. And we'll hear a new recording of this work featuring conductor Leif Sagerstam, on Choral Showcase, I'm Bill Bukowski, and I hope you'll tune in Sunday night, October 11th at 9 on Classical WETA. So Beethoven returns to his home from the countryside quietness of Heiligenstadt, and he comes back with renewed purpose, and that is to compose, to, to write music. And this, as we get into his middle period, this is where we find his biggest works um, most of his biggest works, most of his most recognizable works. Now, there's this really interesting book that I highly recommend. It's called Daily Rituals, How Artists Work. Basically, it's a compendium of just so many artists, uh, musicians, writers, painters, sculptors, and so on. And it's someone who has, through either their own journals or research or accounts, have put together the routines that Uh, musicians and composers in this case had. Beethoven was very, very particular in his day. He woke up at dawn and he would get straight to work, but first he would have to have a cup of coffee. Now, how many beans are in a cup of coffee, Bill? I have no idea. I'm not a coffee drinker. (laughs) Couldn't tell you. Well, according to Beethoven, it's 60. It's 60 beans. He would count them out and that is how you made your coffee. Now, as a coffee drinker, is 60 beans a strong cup or a weak cup or somewhere in between? I guess it depends on the size of the bean, but This is not unusual today. I know plenty of people on Instagram posting how many grams of water they use for their coffee, exactly how many grams uh, and the grind of the of the beans. So Beethoven is kind of almost ahead of his time, I think, with his very particular coffee tastes. Yeah, but just imagine him making an order at Starbucks. No, I would not want to be his waiting on him at a cafe. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So after his 60-bean cup of coffee, he's working basically straight to 2 or 3 early afternoon. This is super common for a lot of artists. Wake up, work straight into lunch. He would have lunch, and then he would do something that so many composers have done, and that is go on long walks. He would go to walk through Vienna. He would walk through the countryside, and he always had something with him, didn't he, to write down little melodies and ideas. Right, because you never know when inspiration will strike. And according to Beethoven, he remembered, I'm sure this is a little bit of hyperbole, but he said he remembered every single melody he ever thought of. And he could recall them at an instant. And the interesting thing is Beethoven was, if you look at his manuscripts when he's composing, it looks like a disaster. It looks like modern art. Everything is scratched out. There's ink everywhere because he would revise, revise, revise and change and change and change, um, almost distilling music down to its essence and then expanding it from there. Phenomenal 
a composer with all those musical ideas in his head just rushing around and trying to get written down. Yeah, and he would often do that on these long walks. Then he would have a simple dinner and then go to the theater, a concert, or rest, enjoy a pipe, and it was bed by 10. Now, that's a pretty orderly schedule, but his his life in his apartment wasn't very orderly, was it? It was pretty dirty, his, his house. That's what I've heard, yeah, that he was not the best uh, tenant, let's just say. He splashed water everywhere. It would go down into the people's apartment below. Food left uneaten on tables and chairs and on the floor. And even worse, a chamber pot full under the piano. No, oh, let's not go there. <laughs> no. So a lot of his big works come from this period, and looking already to his big symphony, uh, number three, the Eroica Symphony. This has a little bit of a, a backstory, doesn't it, with Napoleon? Yeah, the, the story was that Beethoven was an admirer of Napoleon. Napoleon, like Beethoven, came from the hinterlands, and uh, in a time when of the Enlightenment where that celebrated the people, uh, the individual people and the power of the individual people, Beethoven or Napoleon was somebody that Beethoven really admired. Only to a certain point, though, when somebody started putting on airs, that's when Beethoven got his back up, and this was a classic case. He even, like, scratched out or tore up the paper, uh, the front of the manuscript, right, that had Napoleon's name written on it. After Napoleon had declared himself emperor. Yes. I love the opening to this symphony. If his first symphony opened with kind of posing a question with this unresolved chord, you know, what is this? That's an opening that just grabs you right by the throat. And to think a lot of introductions in symphonies at this time were to bring you in, right, to get you used to the themes and the ideas. People would talk, right, at the beginning of concerts? Yeah, it was not uncommon back in, the, in those days. And nowadays, concert halls tend to be quieter spaces. But back then, people would be talking, carrying on, uh, enjoying food or drink or whatever. And uh, then the music would start. And this would, I imagine, really shock some people when they hear this for the first time. There's almost no introduction. It's these two huge E-flat chords. And then it continues with an arpeggio. The, the music is outlining those chords. And for me, I feel like it's just this kind of flower or a seed. And the entire symphony evolves from just this simple E-flat major chord. And even actually right from the beginning, he starts adding in notes that are nowhere near E-flat major, like C-sharp. And adding that in in the first couple of seconds, I think, was probably pretty revolutionary for the time. Exactly. And then the journey begins. But once he's got you with those, those two opening chords, then you're off, for, you're off on the ride. The door is opened, and away you go. And Beethoven's music has been used in pretty much any manner you can imagine, especially in the last uh, century with television, film, music, sampling, even actually with his third symphony, the tragic um, assassination of JFK. Yeah, that was, uh, there was a story that I believe it was the Boston Symphony was yes. giving a concert the afternoon that uh, JFK was murdered. And uh, the conductor read the news out and the piece that they played in memoriam was the uh, the slow movement from the Symphony Number no. Three, right? The, the the funeral march. Yes, and I actually have the audio of that radio broadcast, and I'll put it on the on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. But you hear everyone just gasp and shriek in in the horror of it. But you can you can tell that they've heard it, but they don't believe it. And then when he turns, Eric Leinsdorf says, "We're going to play the funeral march from Beethoven's Third, and he starts playing it right away. You hear the despair, and mm. that is – Beethoven's music has been used in so many ways in comfort or solace or, or anything. That symphony is also huge because there's not two horns, but there's three horns. And at the time, it was, well, what are you doing? You're adding even more brass. And that brings us to his symphony number no. five where he uses not just more horns, but for the first time – and I'll say I think – I really think it's the first time that trombones are used in a symphony – and they sit here for the whole time, and they come in the last movement. But his fifth symphony is pretty remarkable. I think this might be the most recognizable little motif at the beginning. In all of classical music, uh, certainly. Mm -hmm. 
Also, that uh, opening motif uh, was used during the Second World War. It's a uh, Morse code dot 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 dash. Right. And it was used to announce new, a news bulletin. The the uh, as a matter of fact, the Allies used it, and the Axis powers used it as well. Right. It means um, in Morse code, it means it's it's the letter V, and it's still used. I'm it's I'm a nerd. I love Morse code, and I use it every day. And it's still used every day in bulletins, da-da-da-da, 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 right at the start. So his Fifth Symphony is remarkable. I wish we could listen to the whole thing. There's something else that I think Beethoven does here, and that is he uses, oftentimes you hear the strings do something, and then the winds do something, right? Kind of a call and response right. kind of thing. Beethoven kind of flips it around. He has the horns introduce a line that the strings then take and evolve on a little. And that's just, it's so subtle, but I think at the time, even the, a lot of the audience, especially the people who were musicians at the time, would, would definitely notice that. Right, exactly. Okay, so we've heard some of his, his big symphonies. Well, actually, let's, let's listen to his number six a little bit. This has a story that kind of goes with it, doesn't it? Yeah, this is, gets back to Beethoven taking his long walks in the country, as you mentioned a little bit earlier. And we call it his uh, pastoral symphony. And there's different movements with different names. The first one, arriving in the countryside with happy feelings. Uh, one movement is storm. What I find remarkable, Bill, is that he starts the opening. We'll listen to it now. And it's you definitely hear this, exactly what it sounds like, arriving in the countryside with happy feelings. There's this kind of drone of like a shepherd instrument in the beginning. There's a warm, bright sound to that, too. I think that just carries you with him. You, you know that Beethoven was, you could tell just how much he enjoyed nature walks. And that's why I think it's so remarkable that just a few years before, he was writing in his Heiligenstadt Testament how he was, he was just humiliating that in the distance he heard a shepherd singing or the person next to him did, and he couldn't hear anything. Mm. And now he's writing about arriving in the countryside with happy feelings. He's taking what he couldn't hear and making it better. We can get to some of his big piano works now. His piano sonata number 21, the Waldstein. And this was dedicated to his patron Waldstein, wasn't it? Yes. I think Beethoven, he can write these lullabies, these kind of, they sound like lullabies. But again, Beethoven goes much, much deeper with it. It's like this, it gets to like your heart and your soul. And then he can change it around and turn it into something else just a, a minute later. So I have two examples here that we'll hear um, this kind of lullaby and then what it kind of sounds like a minute later. goes from a lullaby to this kind of anthem that makes you it make it it's inspiring it almost sounds also like there's multiple people at the piano like one person can't play that i was just thinking the same thing myself the cascades up and down the keyboard yes there's, there's got to be somebody else in there yeah i would it's that's why it's so much fun to when you hear these works and then see someone perform them and you can and then you can see how they move their hands to make it sound like two people at the same time Big piano sonatas, Waldstein, uh, also Appassionata. Trills are very big in Beethoven's music, isn't it? You hear trills a lot in his piano music especially, but also later on in his, in his orchestra stuff. But the Appassionata... A very turbulent work. I think it's about the best way to describe that. Um, and the, the energy and the frustration that Beethoven must have been feeling at times, I think, kind of leaks out in this particular work.
Again, it sounds like two people sometimes. Again, that's, yeah, Beethoven definitely putting the musicians to work. And the, the low end, he's exploring the whole range of the, of the keyboard. And here's what I mean by, I think he broke pianos playing the end of this. Another example, too, of the musical ideas coming so fast and furiously. I can imagine someone's grandmother in the front row at this patron's concert being offended by the, the sudden loud sounds she's never heard before. Exactly, yeah. There is a date in history that must have been one of the greatest dates, I think, for classical music. December 22nd, 1808, Beethoven puts this huge concert together. This is a remarkable concert. Uh, just imagine, if you will, now. This premieres of his symphonies five and six, examples of which we just heard. The piano concerto number four, the choral fantasy for piano, chorus, and orchestra. I mean, just imagine a concert with all of that. It was like four hours long, too. Yeah, and it's just, I, they do not know how lucky they were to hear that concert five and six, the piano concerto and the choral fantasy. And you just know there was some, there was some guy who watched it, you saw the concert, didn't get it, and then later at the pub was like, nah, it was okay. Yeah, or could you imagine somebody getting up and leaving in the middle of it? Oh my gosh, I yeah. didn't think about that. Right. How could you? The, we heard the five and six. The choral fantasy is a work I really didn't know until, until recently. This is really fascinating. It's a solo work for keyboard, but also has solo singers and a choral. I mean, what exactly, how would you describe it even? I, this is one of those works, those Beethoven works from time to time that you hear you, that you think Beethoven is trying something new. Let's see if this works. It's like working something out. Let me see if this works. Like the uh, the triple concerto, a piano trio concerto, if you will, or the choral fantasy. It's like, what is in, what in the world is he trying to do? It sounds like a simple rhapsody for piano and orchestra, and it turns into something quite different. And it's it's sort of a one-off in his uh, opus collection, but at the same time, it points the direction towards the future, especially when you hear the actual choral piece itself at the end. I like that. It's like a prototype. Exactly. He's testing it out. Is this, does this work? Um, I don't know. Let's find out. And he's 38 years old, so his, his hearing loss, and the thing is, his hearing loss wasn't like a volume knob. It didn't just go down. The noise floor was getting higher. Um, the higher pitches he was losing, he couldn't hear like high notes on a flute or, or an oboe. He heard like rumbles. That's kind of, it just sounded like a loud rumbling sound. And even I've heard that if you shouted at him to hopefully get him to hear what you're trying to say, it would be horrible. Like the sound would be something, I guess, with your neurology, it would actually amplify this kind of horrible rumbling, screeching sound in your head. And just imagine how frustrating that would be for a composer and a musician. And what, what would people say? You know, they go to see a concert while Beethoven can't hear. What could he write? Not understanding, of course, you, you write and you hear the music in your head. But let's I want to hear more of this this choral fantasy. And if you've, people have never heard I think a lot of people haven't heard this. It's a very rare work, actually. It's a rare work. And when I first heard it, I thought, why does this sound like Ode to Joy, but we're always like taking the wrong turn right. to get to the street? Right. And so I can, we can kind of build up to this with a few examples. Here is a little bit of the choral fantasy. <laughs> When I first heard that, I was like, oh, what, what, what does that remind that? me of, right? Yeah, it's like, what, what, it, what is this? Am I listening? What am I listening to right now? And then it goes on a little further. And if you're not convinced, this happens just a little bit later towards the end. (laughs) 
it's just remarkable. You know, that that's one tune that I'm really glad Beethoven didn't just let go. Yes. And that's the thing. Beethoven wouldn't just let go. He would find an idea, and as this, like this prototype, he realizes, no, it's not done yet. I, I need to revise more, rip it up again, do this, do that. And over, I think, like 15 years later, we would get his Ninth Symphony. He also mentions it in a letter, which I'll mention later on as well. So this is towards the end of what we consider his, what we call his middle period, right? Where, or his heroic period in this kind of, well, the music sounds actually quite heroic. But it's also the bulk of his uh, big symphonic and um, chamber music output. Beethoven was working very, very hard from the very beginning when he set out to compose and compose music that meant something not just to him but to the future. He was very busy and he kept very busy. And some of his greatest works, as you just said, come from this uh, particular time period. And we're going to get into his late period and his final years right after this. Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. So we get into what we call his late period. And he's still composing, but he has a decline in his in his composing. He is having, throughout this period, he has family issues. His brother gets sick, um, and eventually his brother dies. He tries to take custody over his nephew, Carl. It becomes a very turbulent time, kind of almost returning to his childhood, the trauma and issues he had growing up. Right, and, and leaving him far less time to compose as he would have liked, I'm sure. Yes. And he patrons were so important. Perhaps his most important or his biggest patron is the Archduke Rudolf. Beethoven is 40 years old, and he writes this um, this trio, which we call the Archduke Trio, and it is super performed uh, then and today. It was basically instantly loved, and he also taught this Archduke music, like how to compose even. Yeah, he was an interesting character. He was the youngest son of the emperor and uh, eventually uh, went took holy orders. But he was a, a pupil of Beethoven, and by accounts, he was a very congenial uh, fellow. And Beethoven was not the kind of person that would get along with somebody of a very, uh, an ego that was very much like his. That just would not have worked. But Archduke Rudolf was very loyal and uh, very generous, and Beethoven returned that loyalty and the generosity with the music that he wrote for him. And these patrons rallied around Beethoven saying, hey, stay in Vienna, keep composing, we will pay you with no strings attached almost, just just stay and compose. That in, in and of itself too was a relatively new thing at the time. Um, the model that everybody was looking for before Mozart and Haydn was for steady employment. Haydn got it, Mozart did not, Beethoven didn't care a fig for steady employment just as long as the money kept coming in and he could write what he wanted, when he wanted, and premiere it how he wanted to. And I heard that he, Beethoven was even just awful to some of his patrons, like screaming at them, calling them names. There's one account of, of something, him calling someone a pig or something, and it was almost like, okay, Beethoven, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, don't forget we have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> right. His friends sort of knew when to sort of pull back and, and let him get it out of his system, so to speak. Uh, Beethoven did not have patience for foppery or... Uh, pretension, and um, he was also not the kind of person who would take abuse from his social betters very well. Yes, I recall he said to one patron, you know, or like a like a it was a prince. You you are a prince. You are born into this by chance. There will be thousands of princes. There is one Beethoven. And he was right. Exactly. Here is a little bit because I want to and listen to some of this in his later period of his. Archduke Trio. The scene, again, I, I'm always obsessed with the openings of Beethoven's work. The scene that is instantly painted 
transport you to somewhere completely different. And then the rubato, the the slowing down of the tempo, it's kind of free for a moment where each instrument gets to make a, a little statement before going on. You know, it's interesting. Beethoven doesn't just invite you in. He takes you by the hand or sometimes by the arm. I like that. Yeah, that said, you're, taking, you're either going by the hand or by the arm, wherever it is in the music. Beethoven, he is taking you there. A few years later, he's in his um, mid-40s now. He has like a celebrity endorsement for a metronome. No kidding. Yes, in 1817. I mean, that's great. But also in 1814, Beethoven made his very final public performance, actually playing the uh, performance of the Archduke Tree that we just heard. That was his final performance because his hearing was completely gone to the point where he could not perform with other people. Right. And then a few years later, he gets a celebrity endorsement for a metronome. I find that so funny. I would love to see an ad for this for this metronome. Clicks better than ever before. <laughs> the question is, now with Beethoven having totally lost his hearing, he can't be the musician, the virtuoso in terms of playing with others. We have his music because of that. Right. His, would he have composed as much if his hearing was fully there and he could just do his performances. Exactly, exactly. And when certain sounds are lost to you, where do you go? Well, you try to make new ones. One sense was closed, but the other sense, his compositional sense, reached further than it probably would have. I think his um, Hammerklavier Sonata, if his earlier works for the piano were demanding, I don't know what this was. I think they he must have had... The piano was braced extra well or something because there's huge demands on the instrument in this work. What's interesting about that, too, is the nickname itself, Hammer Clavier, is more of a, a guide or a direction. Like, this is the kind of piano you need if you're going to play this work successfully. Those chords at the beginning, they're massive and commanding. They're actually kind of simple, I think. It's different voicings of like a, a B-flat major chord, but they're hard to play like that. And then all of a sudden, it goes to something so soft and intimate drawing you into the music. Right, and you can also hear why you need that particular kind of piano probably closer to the, the modern concert grand that we're familiar with, one that can play the whole, the complete dynamic range that he's calling for there. Yes, he for sure had a hand in, in developing all of that. The end displays really what he's doing with, with trills. Up to this point, trills were kind of an ornament. It added, if you repeated a section, you might add ornamentation like a trill in Mozart's time and before. It was something that added more flavor to the music. Beethoven advances this to... Like like a new degree, and it's no, it's not just this little ornament. It is a, it's a technique in playing, and also a technique in developing the music as well. Here's the end, which I think really drives home these trills. And when you see this in concert, I think like Beethoven would, pianists come out of the seat when they play these chords sometimes. Like they lift out. That's right. That's right. Some of his biggest final works in his later period were now he's um, in his 50s, his early 50s. His hearing has declined. He's using these conversation books, and that is we have um, hundreds of pages compiled where he would carry these around with a pencil and if you wanted to ask him a question or speak to him, you had to write it down on the paper. But Beethoven was still able to answer you verbally. So we have just a, a huge amount of resources, but none of the answers hmm. that Beethoven gave. One of those questions being, hey, you met Mozart, right? Was he a good pianoforte player? And we don't know what the answer we was. We don't know what the answer was. Or I think one was also, is it a cantata or a mass? What are you working on? Right. It's like, ugh, we don't know. But we do know... His, um, he's 52, 53, and he completes his Misa uh, Solemnis, the Solemn Mass, right? Right. That was another work that he dedicated to the Archduke. And it was also another work that 
that took the idea of some compositional form and just completely sent it off into outer space. How was it very different, I guess, from a mass of Haydn's or before? It was probably never really designed for liturgical use. Uh, it was definitely designed for the concert hall, which uh, at its root, most masses were meant to be played in churches for a service. Beethoven, that wasn't the idea. It was, let's do a solemn mass and let's do it the way Beethoven wanted to do it. It's a, it's a, it's a grand work, uh, almost superhuman. Could you imagine your church uh, today performing a Gloria quite like that? Right. I mean, it's how many more decades would go by before composers were writing a mass or anything for voice and orchestra like that? I mean, even I think Brahms, the German Requiem, yes, and Berlioz, but I mean, this is... Yeah, it even also points ahead, I think, to um, the one other work that I would compare it to would be Verdi's Requiem, also not designed for a church, more for a concert hall, and also... uh, being grander than any kind of requiem that anybody had ever heard before. Right. The same thing with the Missa Solemnis. And this Missa Solemnis, it was premiered in April of 1824. The next month, he would premiere what many would then consider the greatest symphony ever composed, the final symphony Beethoven would leave us with, and that is his his ninth. Had a big successful premiere in in Vienna, but Beethoven actually wanted it somewhere else, didn't he? He did not want to be, he was kind of getting tired of the Viennese audience. He was getting a little annoyed with Vienna. Um, Vienna, historically, from even back before Beethoven came along and afterwards, uh, the musical audiences there were very fickle, always looking for the next new thing. And the new thing at this particular time was the operas of Rossini. Now, I don't know what Beethoven thought of Rossini, but I know that he was annoyed with Viennese over-passionate response to Rossini, and so he wanted to write something completely different again. And he was writing in letters to one of his students, uh, his secretary, Ferdinand Ries, I believe in London, saying, hey, I want to do this. I've got this symphony, and I want to, let's do it in London. Right, exactly. So take it away from Vienna. If Vienna's not interested in what Beethoven's doing now, let's find some place that is. But the problem is Beethoven already in his early 50s, he's getting pretty sick. His health is... Not well. It was always, wait for me next summer. Okay, wait for me. Okay, another month. Just give me time. And he was never, he never actually went to London, which is, which is sad in its own sense, but he, he just wasn't physically well enough to get there. Right. I think the other thing, too, that there were also enough still of Beethoven's friends and patrons that said, no, 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 do it here. We'll, we'll help you. That's right. They, because they were, they were still very interested in keeping him there. And in one of these letters where he writes to a, a music publisher in Leipzig, he writes, this is just uh, a little bit before, and he's writing from Vienna. He says this, I must, alas, now speak of myself and say that this, the greatest work I have ever written, is well worth 1,000 florins. And that, and that time was just um, multiple yearly salaries for people. Beethoven continues, It is a new, grand symphony with a finale and voice parts introduced, solo and choruses, the words being those of Schiller's immortal Ode to Joy, in the style of my pianoforte, choral fantasia, that choral fantasy we heard, only of much greater breath. That's an understatement. (laughs) To say the least, to say the least, and so is a thousand florins when you come right down to it. And with the opening of this symphony, Beethoven is, I mean, he's always doing something new. His third, we had that kind of explosion. In the fifth, we have that just immortal figure. In the sixth, we have that countryside. In this, we almost start from nothing. It starts from nothing, exactly. And so we'll listen to a little bit of this now. And I've not changed any of the volume or dynamics, so don't turn your headphones all the way up because it will get very, it will get loud. But it starts so soft.
lean in is did the music start and then it's just it's monumental yes but you know the other interesting thing too this gets back to what you were saying earlier about uh his earlier symphonies the raw material is right there from the very first notes you can barely hear them but these are going to be what you're going to be hearing as the symphony progresses yes and it is as we'll hear the the ode to joy it's that evolution of the the melody that he thought of like 15 years earlier and there's so many moments in here where the more i listen to them the more i start to hear other composers so here's the opening to the um the second movement Again, it's that bombastic opening, the timpani in between, kind of explosive between the strings. That keeps pushing it along. It, to me, it sounds almost like a dance of death. That's, I think that's it. It sounds like one of those, you know, Franz Liszt Dies Irae moments. Right. He makes you lean into the music. He presents you these um, kind of dance of death moments like in that, in that second this is the introduction that we get for the Ode to Joy, and it's similar in the opening in that we kind of almost start from nothing. It's just a simple little seed of that musical idea. Yeah, and a perfectly formed little tune as well. And this is this is the payoff. This will be the payoff. This is what the symphony has been building to from the very beginning. But what he's doing here, which I just love so much, he's the harmonies are changing. It's this it's new, it's being led by the trumpet, but that rhythm and the timpani, that is from his choral fantasy. That um, hitting on certain beats, that is, um, I just love that. The end of it, though, the final moments, I think, are extraordinary. Because at this point, you've got symphonies of his that end with big chords. Symphonies sometimes end in uh, people are playing all the same note. And here, it's almost like you're being shot out of a cannon off a cliff with the very final moment. It's remarkable. We've arrived. We've arrived. Now, Beethoven at this premiere, he's not conducting it, but he's kind of up at the stage beating time to the conductor. And the conductor, before they started playing, said, do not pay attention to Beethoven at all. Don't look at him. Don't don't go with him. Go with me, and it's going to be okay. Because uh, there's also, he had conducted earlier. It was just a disaster because he, he couldn't hear, and so they weren't following and uh, the conductor says, don't follow him at all. And think of it, too. This music was completely new to these musicians. Yes. I mean, forget the audience for a minute. The musicians yeah. have to play it first. And it was completely new to them and I'm sure very puzzling. Puzzling. And then at the end, this just insane triumph of an ending, the audience is – they love it, right? They're, they're, they're going wild. They're going wild. They're cheering. They're clapping. Beethoven doesn't know it. Yeah, he's still facing the musicians. He's still paging through the score, and he's still beating time. He's still beating time, and he's he doesn't know this. And then the soprano, she has to go over to Beethoven and then turn him around to see the audience. And that's just... That's so poignant. It's so poignant. And just imagine, I don't think she, she would never really understand, live to understand how we see that today of just one of the most unbelievable moments where... Beethoven's Ninth Symphony finishes, and this woman who had no idea that this would happen, that Beethoven would just not even know, and she would have to go over and turn him around and show him the response. Right. It's not too long after this that um, Beethoven starts to really get sick, but just before he's, he's bedridden, he starts to write um, some more string quartets, and we call them these, uh, we call them his late quartets. Now, Bill, if... I think Beethoven left his audience purposefully with the Symphony Number no. 9. Here it is 
I have written what I need to write for, for this medium. Now, I feel like he is looking to the future and future audiences with these string quartets. Some of them don't make sense now. Right. What about this fugue that he writes? It sounds like a lot of composers have even said this will remain contemporary forever. How do you how do you feel about that's this? That's a good uh, way to put it. Right. That's a good way to put it. People are still wrestling with this and what it means. Uh, and you have, I've heard opinions on both sides. Some saying it's very profound. Others are saying it's nonsense. Um, you really have to kind of listen to it if you can and make your own judgments if you can follow along with it. Uh, even his publisher persuaded him. It was supposed to be the finale to one of his quartets, and the publisher persuaded him to write a another finale and keep this one separate. Yes. And this great this grand fugue would be it's standing on its own on its own legs so to speak. Just try to follow along. Here's a little bit. Like, what's going on here? Search me. I mean, I, I feel like, Bill, if you had written this and you showed it to me, I would just be like, you know, how you doing, Bill? Well, of course, I'm no Beethoven. Like, you doing okay? You want to you should take next week Take next week off. Just uh, relax a little. Yeah, it was, it was actually very, uh, very politic that his publisher didn't just tell him to throw it away. He just yeah. said, well, let's try something else here. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, well. And unfortunately, it's... It's shortly after this that Beethoven, he really gets sick. Um, He's 56 – actually, he's 55 years old, I think, by the time he's bedridden. And then a few months later, he would die. But in his final months, he was in bed and he was um, conscious. But he he had, um, I believe, like jaundice and fluid retention. And his heavy, heavy drinking, of course, was – had caught up with him. He had a lot of friends and patrons and publishers come by to visit him in his final moments. It sounds like it was actually still kind of busy, although he was bedridden. Yeah, and and folks knew. I think folks knew the end was coming. There's a story of um, a publisher who, I guess just naively, they sent him him as a present, hey, here's a case of wine. And the famous quote is Beethoven was kind of laughing and said, pity, pity too late. Right, yeah, Yeah. far past the time when he could actually enjoy it. Yeah. And that kind of brings us to his his death at the age of 56. Still kind of on the younger side by today's comparison, but certainly much longer than, than Mozart, who only lived to his early 30s. And it makes you ask the question, well, what, what do you play at someone's funeral when that person is Beethoven? Like what, what music? That's a good question. And what's actually played is just a very simple and humble thing that he wrote um, like 15, 14 years earlier, and that is a couple of equali for four trombones, basically equali. Instead of a string quartet of violins, viola, and cello, you have equal voices, like all violins. And he wrote three equali for four trombones. The first and third were performed at his funeral, and there were alternating choral arrangements of them sung kind of alternating back and forth. And the second one was actually sung by a male, just a small male choir at his um, gravesite. Now, pretty remarkable, almost on the nose, who would follow in his footsteps, who actually was a pallbearer, and that's Franz Schubert, wasn't it? That's interesting, too. Uh, Schubert was a great admirer of Beethoven's. Uh, even in Schubert's own Ninth Symphony, he makes a little tip of the hat to the choral finale to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And also, sadly, Schubert would not live uh, far past uh, Beethoven's death. That's right. Now, what is it like in the decades to come? I know a lot of composers were almost afraid to write a symphony to be compared to Beethoven. Or like I think they joked with Schubert, oh, that's just Beethoven's 10th right. kind of thing. Right. Or that they said the same thing about Brahms's first. It's like he set the bar very high and composers could either approach it, touch it, try to go beyond it, or just uh, ignore it completely. But he set the bar and he set the standard, uh, making the symphony to be an expression of a very personal nature. 
Beethoven lived an incredibly rich musical life, but obviously it was very difficult. It wasn't easy. It was hard for him. And he, as we saw in this Heiligenstadt Testament, he had anxiety. He had a problem, had issues with how he might be perceived as a composer or a musician who had the greatest ears of all time to then not have the ability to hear at all. And as he struggled his whole life. Yeah, and I think, too, the other thing about Beethoven is that I don't think that he really left anything uncompleted uh, the way other composers have. I don't think that that was the case with Beethoven. I think he said what he needed to say, and we're still wrestling with it, and we're still enjoying it, and we're still finding it challenging and inspiring today. We can leave it with this. Beethoven, as we saw with his patrons, he knew how to throw an insult, right? I think his musical insults were even better. Now, Bill, if I wanted to call you the donkey of all donkeys, I might write something like this. This is a little something he wrote. It's like 20 seconds long. Esa a la iso, basically donkey of all donkeys. And here it is. And once again, Beethoven gets the last word. <laughs> yes, that's a donkey. E, uh, e. I just imagine him sitting down. He wrote that in five, ten minutes, kind of laughed, and said, all right, I got to go to lunch, that kind of thing. Well, thank you so much, Bill. It's, it's hard to navigate the life of someone like Beethoven, but I love your insight and everything we've talked about. John, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information on Beethoven, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. And if you have any comments or ideas, send them to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. Classical Breakdown.